I am Inga Larissa. And I am Jennifer Rose. Sister, the podcast. We are two whiskey pals serving a weekly whiskey podcast and rocking your whiskey world. Exploring the whiskies and distilleries of the world and meeting amazing people along the way. We'll be sticking our noses into our jams and all things whiskey. So fill your whiskey glass and join the fun. Season three. Brace yourself. Welcome back, listeners. The Whiskey Sisters return. I'm not sure about you, Jen, but I feel like time went really fast. So fast. Like when we first went off for a break, I thought, oh, there's ages till we start recording again. But here we are, and it is lovely to be back. In today's episode, we will be featuring Campbelltown based Springbank and sample two releases from the distillery. But first of all, how are you, Inca? I'm good, yeah. Weather is nice. It's summer pretty much here in Italy. All good. And oh. looking forward to our Portugal Metal Crew concert rock and roll fest. I know when we first booked that, it seemed ages ago and now it's so close. So yes, listeners, we're at that crucial stage of planning our outfits for the rock festival that we're going to be going to. And I just hope they've got some good whiskey for sale at the gig because often gigs light you down and there's a really poor selection of whiskey. Yeah, I don't think many festivals, yeah, they don't really seem to have any whiskeys. I I remember when we uh, went to Metallica in Florence and we were kind of swearing that why there's no highballs? (laughs) Where's all the highballs <laughs> exactly you can Ex- get rum and gin and all that but where's whiskey highballs exactly i think you know let's assess this next gig we go to together and if it's not any better i think we need to start some sort of campaign to change yeah. this or have our own stand <laughs> touring all the rock festivals <laughs> exactly exactly what's new with you I'm good, Inca. I had a wee break from drinking whiskey. Body's a temple and all that. I had a bit of a pause. (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) I I know. So I'm ready to rock once again. So that's all good. I think I've drunk for both of us then. (laughs) (laughs) Before we get started with all the spring bank action, uh, let's stick our noses into the latest whiskey news. Stick your nose in it. As we are talking about Campbelltown in this week's episode, it makes sense to mention the latest news about Glasgow-based whiskey bottler and blender Brave New Spirits, who have submitted a planning application to build a single malt whiskey distillery in Campbelltown. The application to Argyle and Butte Council details plans to build the new distillery at the former RAF Macrahanish Airbase. Witchburn Distillery, as it would be called, would produce unpeated, lightly peated and heavily peated single malt whiskies. So now we just need to wait and see. So obviously submitting a planning application doesn't mean it will actually happen and I've heard all sorts of stories about the planning process. So all the best for for this distillery. Yeah, all the best Brave New Spirits. They've got super cool labels and, you know, for the releases they've done so far. And I'm liking the name Witchburn Distillery. So sending good vibes their way. Talking about new distillery plans, Isla Scotch whiskey maker Kiel Homan has received planning permission to build a rum distillery in Barbados. I know it's not really whiskey, but it's kind of super cool. Kiel Homan purchased a derelict Bentley mansion and nine acres of land located in the Paris of St. Philip in August 2021. The whiskey producer plans to house a rum distillery, mill and cask warehouse and purchase sugarcane from the mansion's surrounding fields. Amazing. No I've seen way. pictures of this mansion and it's like proper massive and oh, just, really? the style is really cool. Yeah. <gasps> So the rum will, will be made using cane syrup and sugarcane crust on site. The liquid will be distilled using two copper stills and bottled on site. Gil Holman founder and managing director Anthony Wills has teamed up with Frank Ward, the former managing director of Barbados distillery Mount Gay. So big name there mm-hmm. um, on this project and Ward will act as a consultant and advice on rum production methods. So we can obviously also expect Kiel Homan to start doing some like rum cask finishing. Rum cask with finishes. Their own, yeah, yeah. With their own casks. That's amazing. We need to watch this space. I have really enjoyed rum over the years, but I fell out with it recently in Paris, didn't I? And there was a bit of an incident. <laughs> yeah, just a wee one. <laughs> yeah. So I'm a little I'm a little bit wounded from my experience with rum in Paris, but I'm sure by the time that that is in production, I'll feel 
you know, strong enough to give it a try. Edgington UK has launched the Still House podcast, a nine episode series created to celebrate all things dark spirits. And the podcast is hosted by Becky Paskin, the founder of Our Whiskey. Congratulations, Becky. Each episode provides a forum for education and conversation around growing the dark spirits category. The podcast will also provide advice and tips from those at the heart of dark spirits production to inspire businesses across the on and off trade. See, when it says dark spirits, I always think like dark arts, you know, Harry (laughs) Potter. (laughs) <laughs> uh, <laughs> and it sounds kind of cool and like alchemical i actually listened to the first episode and they are talking they are literally talking about every uh, dark spirit so not just whiskey but also you know brandy rum whatever is there amazing so yeah yeah, check it out and give it a listen there's also been many new releases from several brands and especially all the festival releases for face ile camp alton mold festival and spirit of space festival and so on not gonna list it all but just there's a lot going on have you tried anything new recently or anything exciting whether it's it could be like an old mold as well but anything that kind of i know you said that you haven't been drinking much but yeah I mean, I've not, I've not really, in all honesty, after season two, I thought I'm going to consolidate the beautiful drams of season two. So I've really been enjoying a lot of like Glen Allocky, Glen Dronachs, and just sort of, you know, sipping away on, on kind of old favourites. However, I've been highly excited by the news as those of uh, our listeners that have been, you know, tuned in before and listened to season two, we've spoken quite a lot about Blackened American Whiskey. I'm so excited because the Spirits Co has announced recently, hasn't it, that Blackened is now available in the UK and Europe and shipping commences on the 29th of me so i'm very excited about this yes yeah that is because we need a stock up as well stock up. Ex- yeah, yeah exactly because i've been sort of <laughs> hesitant about drinking it because it just feels like so yeah. hard to get whereas now i'm just going to be fast and wild with the measures Woo-hoo! i know last time <laughs> i was drinking it was with those cheese buffs and i thought oh i want more i want more but i had to like hold myself back that's and, it and also i'm super excited about the glen scotia um you know the Campbell Down Malt Festival bottling, but I haven't tried it yet. But obviously, we both got a bottle each. Thank you very much, Glen Scotia. Yes, and um, we're very sad that we weren't able to accept their amazing invitation to be at the Campbelltown Malt Festival. I know. Oh. I honestly cried myself to sleep that day. I've got FOMO. Have you seen all the stuff on? Yeah, like, I'm Instagram? not even looking. Like I'm like refusing to like anything. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to write nice comments because I'm just feeling <laughs> yeah. like jealous. I know. Yeah, not even <laughs> envious, just jealous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I did try um, the Victoriana. <gasps> recently and it was so good I had to like order another one because oh. it was just like I, I really loved the the 15 was really nice but mm-hmm. Victoriana is another level Victoriana is next level delicious we should perhaps do a whole episode on Victoriana at one point just celebrate and luxuriate in the delight that is that release yes that sounds good sounds good to me it's nice to be back, Enka. I know, it's good. Yeah, I felt like my life was incomplete yeah. until this moment. Not enough drams, not enough chat. And we'll be sticking to, you know, the good old format that we all know and love, but we'll be adding in some Whiskey Pals banter and some random chats in this season ahead as well, won't we? Yes, there will be some new little twists and turns. Thank goodness we have voiceover Bob back for more because it wouldn't be Whiskey Sisters without him. Whiskey Sisters! Campbelltown, at one time in the past, with a then population of just 1,969, was reputed to be the richest town in Britain per capita. Ooh, make it rain! There were so much going on when it came to distilling and selling whiskey. And I think at one time, the most distilleries they had was 34. Oof. Yeah. And the first reference to Campbelltown whiskey is from 1591. So, you know, very long time ago. Yeah. 1601, 
the region was a thriving whiskey smuggling center and a place for illegal production. It was around that time the Mitchell family, the founders of Springbank, came to Campbelltown from the lowlands. And some of the family members were already actually molsters, so they had some experience. Springbank remains the oldest independent family-owned distillery in Scotland. That's pretty cool, isn't it? That is pretty cool. Campbelltown malt was booming and demand high. By 1814, there were 22 illegal rock and roll and distilleries in the area, although it wasn't until 1828 that Springbank was built by Archibald Mitchell. And in 1834, Archibald's sister Mary built Drumore Distillery. And soon after, brothers John and William Mitchell, Archibald's sons, took ownership of Springbank. Later, John takes his sons into the business, forming the company J and A Mitchell. Crazy demand for Campbelltown malts continues, so William decides to grow the family venture into the whiskey trade and Glengyle Distillery is founded. Pretty crazy, like the whole family doing all that and Mary joining in, amazing. Yeah, Just... and, and that appetite for it and the demand high from way back then. Exactly. The turn of the century brings a change of whiskey preferences and spring back all to tape production accordingly to make lighter whiskey that was not as heavily peated using coal rather than peat to dry day malt. In the 1920s, some of the Campbelltown distilleries started cutting corners to meet demand for whiskey, resulting in blenders turning their back on Campbelltown and looking elsewhere for consistently better malt. One by one, these distilleries began to close, including Glengoyle. I think that was also probably the time when Scotch whiskey had a bad reputation. I think it was yeah. booming so much, everyone wanted to get a piece of it, and then they kind of, because it was so popular, they started to just make shit. Yeah, and it just became like that in that scabby phase yeah in the 1980s scotch in general were struggling yet springbank continued production although it was sporadic at best so they were kind of closed a wee bit and then back on and it's like interesting isn't it that that was a period of real like low production in the 1980s when it was such a cool decade for movies and music as i'm obsessed with <laughs> yeah <laughs> but yeah like not so much for whiskey right there wasn't so much happening then finally there's light at the end of the tunnel and in the 1990s whiskey demand sees growth. Springbank's like, maybe that's because I became of drinking age then. Do you think so? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> My narcissistic thoughts that I turned the whole industry. Springbank's single malt reputation takes off around the world and a large outturn of top quality bottlings are released, which really cement the distillery's reputation for producing world-class whiskey. In the year 2000, the current chairman of Springbank and the great great grandson of Archibald Mitchell buys the Glengyle Distillery buildings, bringing Glengyle back into the hands of the family line. And um, the rebuilt Glengyle Distillery, the first new distillery in Campbelltown for over 100 years at that time, and the first distillery built in Scotland in the 21st century, has its first distillation run. Campbelltown is once again recognised as a distinct whiskey region. That's like such an achievement, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. It's nice that they managed to get their hands back on it. But yeah, so we're, we are really seeing now uh, like a massive popularity of obviously Springbank, like the whole cult following, but also Glen Scotia and all these other new distilleries that are yeah. being built or have applied planning permission to the Campbelltown area. Yeah. Like we mentioned earlier at the news, but there's quite a few other ones already. I think it's quite exciting times isn't it why do you think springbank has such a cult following do you know i was wondering that i mean i don't know how long they've had their current labeling because i just think their labeling is epic the font just like roars thunder to me like phew, big flames and i think it looks like the band saxon's font <laughs> and it makes me think of old 1980s like amazing rock music and i was actually when i was tasting for drama on fire listening to saxon because the font like yeah like reminds me of it so for me i just think it's like i know that's maybe superficial but like i, I think it looks so cool the bottle shape the font 
want. And I wonder if it's because, you know, just as we were saying that they began producing these real good quality malts, that the energy of that spread and like the jungle drums were beating that you would get really good quality. I don't know. Yeah. And I I would be surprised to find out that they haven't always had that kind of font because it looks kind of traditional at the same time. Yeah, it's so cool. But what I was thinking is also probably that when they were closing the distillery a little bit and then it was in 2008 um, they were refurbishing the distillery or the warehouses Mm -hmm. so they actually closed for six months so obviously that's a massive gap in production so maybe they didn't have as much and also I read somewhere that they don't actually produce that much I think it was 750,000 liters yeah I think yeah they only produce um let me just see. I've had some notes here. So yeah, they only produce about 15% of the actual capacity annually, ah. which is like tiny, like that's like what, 200 and something thousand. Yeah. And I think however much they made, they would sell, wouldn't they? The demand appears to be insatiable. Yeah, yeah. And like they've started to produce other whiskies as well, other than Springbank, which we will mention in a minute. Yeah. So I don't go too much in the detail, but I think obviously that they will, that will take away from the Springbank. But then that just means that because they have such a cult following, the prices can skyrocket as well. Yeah, and the people will pay. Springbank is the only Scottish distillery to complete 100% of the production process on site, with human involvement at each and every stage. They are the only distillery in Scotland to malt 100% of the barley using traditional floor malting methods. So it makes three distinct malts from one site. Springbank, Hazelburn or Long Row. Oh, Long oh, Row. And- I always say that actually. Long yeah. row, long grow. Um, no. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> like I say long row, but is it long grow? Long grow. L- long. Oh, yeah, long row. Yeah. Long. How do you say that? Long, I think it's long row. Long but row. I say long. <laughs> I, that's what I've been saying. Long grow. <laughs> we don't know. Oh, but it's long- producing. Springbank, Hazelburn, or Long Row, <laughs> or, or Long Row. That's funny. Long Row actually makes more sense. So Springbank, Springbank single malts are like the actual Springbanks uh, are like repeated and distilled two and a half times. Okay, this gets me. How do you do how, how that? Do you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how do you distill two and a half times? Yeah. Like, do you just cut the distillation short, or you just distill half a batch? You know what I mean? Yeah, my mind's blown. I want to be. <laughs> I want to go there and see the production firsthand. Yeah. Before we go and sample the ten-year-old, um, let's chat a little bit about some of the other releases. So the core range includes fifteen, eighteen, twenty-one, twenty-five, and thirty-year-old, and they also have PX ten-year-old, which is matured for seven years in bourbon casks and three years in fresh PX casks. And I found this funny, though, because it's a 10-year-old and the only difference is the PX cask. Mm -hmm. Classic 10-year-old is only uh, 50 pounds a bottle, but this one is 90. Oh, I Mm. think I paid more than that for the 10-year-old. Did you? I think so. I got got it. a whiskey shop when I was driving actually from Speyside back to Glasgow and I stopped somewhere and I saw it in this specialist whiskey shop and I was like ah I must have it but I think it was like mm, between 70 and 80 pounds oh see that's what I mean with the cult following and then the limited number so people can really ask more yeah Hmm, it's a bummer um okay so yeah they also have local barley series the local barley is an annual release made from barley grown in and around Campbelltown. Each year, a local farmer is commissioned to grow barley on the distillery's behalf to continue producing this grain to glass limited edition. And different farms, barley varieties, cask maturations, and length of time the whisky spends in the casks from one batch to the next allow the customer to find unique tasting experiences every time. First distilled in 1973, Long Row is the result of an experiment carried out by Springbank's chairman who set out to prove that an Isla single style malt could be produced on the mainland. So named after another lost distillery of Campbelltown, which once operated 
located right next door to Springbank, whose warehouses now house Springbank's bottling hall. So hopefully we are pronouncing it correctly now. Today, the long row heavily peated, wonderfully smoky whiskey is available in three bottlings, peated, red and 18 year old. Have you tried it? I have not. I've seen it everywhere, but I haven't really I think because I've never really known much about it I have tried it Inca remember I told you that I was drinking double Glenmorden juice and I went to see Top Gun and I was crying the whole way through the double bill (laughs) so I was in an emotionally vulnerable state and we went to the pot still afterwards and I thought I'm going to get some of that long row because it looks really cool and it's associated with Springbank not really knowing what I was buying and it was too grown up for me but I think you would love it Mm. it was kind of like beefy vibes and I felt too and then I felt more emotional because I bought too smoky a dram yeah you needed like a cherry bomb huggy yeah or like a really sweet bourbon cask exactly Inca you know me so but I think Ah. let's maybe revisit that when I'm less when I've got more emotional stability and we'll we'll give that a whirl yeah definitely good good thinking so the Hazelburn range takes its name also from um, Campbelltown's Lost Distillery, first produced at Springbank Distillery in 1997. So this is a little bit newer player. And it makes full use of all three stills. This range is triple distilled and unpeated, resulting in a spirit that is creamy, delicate and light. That's what you needed that night, didn't you? Yeah, exactly. Um, It is made using only air-dried malt and Hazelburn comes in 10 and 12-year-old expressions. So just to do a quick recap, Springbank makes three different single malts, medium peated, two and a half times distilled Springbank, richly peated, double distilled Long Row and non-peated, triple distilled Hazelburn. Tests at the end. Remember that, listeners. Yeah. (laughs) Dram on fire. Okay, let's get sampling. The first whiskey offers a good introduction to the Springbank range. Ten-year-old, maybe slightly overpriced when I was overcharged, matured in a combination of bourbon and sherry casks and bottled at a respectable 46% ABV, 60% bourbon, 40% sherry split. Okay, so I would say colour is kind of barley, field, yellowy, kind of, I want to say classic whiskey colour. <laughs> Do you know what it really is? And I sat for ages trying to get inspiration because I was enjoying the colour. And I've written sun at dusk because I thought it was kind of like getting dusky, golden sun. But do you know what? It's classic whiskey colour, you're right. <laughs> so on the nose... I was getting kind of slightly tropical notes. I was thinking apricot and maybe even like passion fruit, but Ooh. not like think passion fruit, like a fresh one. And like even the taste that it's kind of sweet and kind of tropical, but has some slightly like, how would you say? It? I don't want to say acidic. Maybe it's a, a citrusy edge. Yeah, citrusy edge. Yeah. And there's definitely some sweetness. They're kind of like a sugary, fruity syrupy sweetness very nice how about you first of all i got a sea breeze not a salty one but i'm near the sea near a farm so not so too salty not too fermented but something hinted at both of those and then i got a sweetness of puff candy you know that honeycomb weird sweetie that i gave you a taste of it's yeah kinda- yeah. yeah, I've opened that actually, had some of it. It sticks to your teeth though, it's, it's really annoying. It's so sticky, isn't it? It's crazy, like Scottish confectionery. A little bit of that on the nose. And, you know, as you're saying, like the syrupy sweetness, I was thinking of pears poached in red wine, fruity, oh. yet becoming a wee bit stickier. Yeah. You know that, what's the cereal? It's called something buff. You know those buff? Sug- sugar puffs. Yeah, that's a little bit maybe in yeah, there as well. A wee bit, that, that kind of malted sweetness. Yeah, and it's kind of honeyed, isn't it? Isn't it like a little bit yeah. honey-coated? I'm yeah. getting that definitely now. Mines has been in the glass a while. And check out the legs slash tears slash whatever you want to call them. Nice, thick, solid, slow Sweet. runners. Yeah, slow runners for sure. Okay, the palate, I was thinking a spiciness, but then sometimes I kind of confuse spiciness with saltiness or like peat. You know what okay. I mean? Yeah, it has like that tingling. Mm-hmm. Definitely some saltiness, sea breeze. 
licorice. I was getting quite a lot of licorice at first. I felt like there was some sort of barbecue coal. Uh, I was trying to figure mm-hmm. out what it is because it wasn't like grassy peat. It wasn't, mm-hmm. it's was kind of like the smell you get from the coals on a barbecue when they kind of dine down. Cool. And yeah, some I found some pear there in the background. And mm-hmm. now with air, I think there's some citrus. I'm just having another sip for research purposes. I'm dedicated to my art. Okay, I can resonate with your tasting notes. I initially got a nice juicy baked brown bread with butter and kind of like set honey on it. So like sweet and malty, juicy and delicious. A zingy kind of ginger baking spice not super citrusy but maybe a bit of a kind of lemon zesty zing somewhere there i enjoy the sweetness it's not like a kind of artificial sweetness to me on the palate it's a like it's not really that sweet like for me i don't find it that sweet no it's like you know like gentle sweetness that's a nice home baking that like probably tastes that it's not too bad for you Kind of like that. <laughs> yeah, and I really like the brown bread. I don't, not so much, I don't know the honey, but the brown bread, uh, now that it's been in the glass and I'm going back to it, yeah, I definitely, I can get that. You know how there's a nice, sometimes gentle sweetness on like tasty brown bread? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that's kind of like the level of sweetness. It's- I think it's quite hard to describe because I think the kind of slightly more savoury or salty elements are quite subtle for me. Mm-hmm. So how about, the, did you get anything exciting in the finish? I found it's a really long finish, a slightly oaky, and then I was thinking maybe like oak furniture that's been polished because I was getting a slightly like furniture polish on the finish. Yeah, there's definitely oakiness, kind of old oak furniture, yeah. And some I I still get saltiness coming through. But it's not super peaty or anything. Did, Did you enjoy no, it i really enjoy it I, but i'm wondering do i enjoy it so much because i was so excited to get the bottle because they're quite hard to get i got the bottle mm-hmm. the, the label gives me good saxon vibes yeah but i quite no, like the colors as well like, you know like a bold aren't they yeah purple yeah. <laughs> just like your classic so that's going on for me so i definitely have this emotional warmth towards the whole brand however i do really like what's in the glass I enjoy this dram. What about you? Uh, I enjoy it, but I'm not like excited about it. Yeah. Do you feel it falls short of the hype? Yeah, definitely. Mm. I think maybe because the hype, I'm expecting more. But then I did read like I've seen loads of mixed reviews, and I don't know if it depends also the annual releases whether they slightly differ. You know. Yeah. Um. Like I wasn't. I wanted to really like it. I don't hate it, but I wouldn't buy a bottle. Because it's so expensive as well. Yeah. Well, I've not, this is the first bottle I've bought. And before, because it's tricky to get, it's maybe just if I see there's bottles at a whiskey bar, I'll maybe try them. So I haven't got a, I haven't had much experience with Springbank. So definitely interested to try more. But one of our lovely listeners sent us a rake of samples and sent us our next Dram on Fire tonight, didn't they? I know, so kind. This one is a special one. It's a Springbank 22 year old open day from 2022 and it's aged in two refilled bourbon hogsheads and in a fresh rum barrel and the split is 80 percent and 20 percent so 20 percent rum bottled at 50.6 percent abv so a bit stronger this was the released as part of last year's campbell town malt festival isn't the whiskey community lovely imagine a whiskey pal sharing that juicy dram with us how nice yeah, i know exactly and I think a lot of the bottles they were selling came in like 200 mil bottles. So it's not like you could yeah. get like a giant, you know, to share. So it's very kind. And we're grateful. And if anyone else wants to send us whiskey, you can. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, this one, I think the color is very similar. Yeah. His name. Maybe a wee bit later. I've written Morning Sun. I'm just trying to be whimsical. And again, very, very slow legs. Yeah. It's more like we would go to that necklace Analy- an- analysis that we heard that <laughs> yeah. we mentioned before because it really stays for a long it, time like it's you know like there's little pearls yeah definitely like a real kind of solid oiliness to it mm, sticky so no at first I was getting dark chocolate gingers Ooh. or this bit of like crystallized ginger in there mixed in with some cardboard <laughs> And there was something smoky. Like I was trying to think like smoked fruit or something, but I couldn't really pinpoint which one it was. Something that you kind of burnt a little bit. And fruity nail polish. 
like something oh. that smells almost like titty fruity titty fruity <laughs> now you know what I mean <laughs> like like maybe sometimes like a lipstick or some sort of makeup smell yeah fruity makeup smell yeah fruity makeup smell I'm loving those like I don't have much left unfortunately of this sample so I'm nosing away furiously it's changed a little bit with the air for me when I first nosed it I got a kind of again a honey but you know that blossom honey that's a bit floral and I was getting lots of kind of natural floral scents making me think of being like in a rose garden or beautiful gardens in the summer day that you know you can have that gentle floral aroma juicy fresh pear yeah, funny that you're saying that now and I'm going back to, I get some that kind of floral. Quite light and refreshing floral sweetness on the nose. Yeah. I'm, I'm wanting to get some of that like nice sort of like kind of charcoal or barbecued fruitiness that you've got. Yeah, I think it's very gentle though. I don't really get it now that it's been in the glass, but that was just from the first. From the first few, nose. Yeah. yeah, it's definitely got sweet, even more sweeter now. I'm thinking pears. So yeah. give us your chat on the palate. How did you find this 22-year-old to taste? Okay, so I found it quite citrusy, oranges and limes. Okay. Some peat smoke and again, that saltiness in there. But like mm. it wasn't giving me so much. Like I need to go for another sip just to remind myself. Slurp on in then, Ka. Go for it. I've just had a wee sip there and it's really softened on the palate comparatively to when I first tried it. I was finding it difficult to describe. I got a gentle creaminess. I was thinking of, you know, like a light, fresh cream cheese, but a nice kick, like red chilies, not overly spicy, but a kind of milder red chili kick. And I was having kind of charcoal, you know, the rocks on a barbecue mm. charcoalness. I'm finding it a bit sweeter and a bit more mellow now, but I'm not quite sure how to describe it. Yeah, it's like spicy Philadelphia. <laughs> yeah, Philadelphia, like creamy, light, fresh, like mildly cheesy with a wee kick yeah and again like I think that peat smoke is funny because it is kind of that kind of coal charcoal yeah you can definitely tell that these these two are related can't you yeah I think you can because when you were getting that kind of charcoal in the palette I thought oh interesting I because I've got that for the next dram I've now at first I thought oh I'm not so sure about that 22 release but now I've finished the sample I'm really sad because it was going down beautifully smoothly with a bit of air in the glass yeah I, and there's definitely some barley something oaty oat biscuity yeah. kind of thing and yeah. the finish a little bit definitely the first time like when I've just opened it and sampled it a little bit I was setting up for this call and just walking around and I was like oh it really I feel like I've just drank orange juice like oh, the really? finis you know like when you drink orange juice and the aftertaste and I felt like on the finis I was getting that wow I don't, I don't really get it now that I just had a sip and it's been in the glass for quite a while and I'm, it feels spicier I get I'm not sure how to describe the finish on that 22 but there's something maybe mildly metallic or like coins in my mouth mm, yeah kind of coppery maybe that's it it's probably the peat it's funny the rum barrel though it doesn't really like it's more on the nose you get the the gingery mm. maybe I don't know like the sweetness it's, but it doesn't really transfer into the palate so this does it it's not like sticky sweet rum vibes like that are overpowering for sure. It's kind of left me more intrigued about Springbank and wanting more from them. Do you think they've got an evil master plan that they have an ingredient to leave you wanting more? <laughs> yeah, I think definitely the PX 10 year old could be interesting. We have to sample a little bit more, but it's not, I would say it's not distillery that I'm like, wow, you know, like, um, Glen Alecky, when we tried it, we're like, whoa, this eight-year-old yeah. is blowing my mind. Yeah. It's not doing that for me. Like, I'm still kind of curious, just, but that's mainly probably because the popularity of it. So yes. I want to discover what everyone else is getting. I didn't find it on this first installment. So I think that's why I want to keep looking. And if there's any Springbank cult members out there, we want to hear your chat. Whiskey Sisters, Whiskey Fact. You mentioned the Glen Gyle earlier how uh, Springbank is now the owner of the old building and so on. So here's a fun fact for you. Glengyle's single malt is called Kilcarran because the Glengyle brand is owned by the neighbour Glen Scotia. Confusing. And Kilcarran is the original name for Campbelltown. So Jen, give us a 
your Campbell Down chat. Originally known as Kinloch Keren, an anglicisation of the Gaelic, which means head of the loch by the Kirk of Kieran. Campbelltown was renamed in the 17th century as Campbellstown after Archibald Campbell, who was the Earl of Argyll, was granted the site in 1667. Cool. How confusing though. It's very confusing, and especially after a few drams because you can't even retain the details. Yeah, I think maybe you should just never mention that the, the building, the distillery is the old Glengyle. Just call it Kilcarran. Yeah. But anyway, so now after we've confused all our listeners, let's say thank you very much for tuning in for our first episode of season three welcome back old listeners and thank you to those that have made it to the end of this episode if you're just new to whiskey sisters well listen back we've got like 48 episodes so go and have a look and let us know what you think and hopefully there will be some new listeners yay (laughs) so anyway next week we are featuring a scottish rye whiskey if i'm right i think is the first rye whiskey in scotland for like donkeys our beaky distillery exciting stuff okay and we would love you if you're not already to follow us on instagram at whiskey sisters.podcast or on twitter at whiskey sisters or on good old-fashioned facebook that hardly anybody uses but we are on there anyway at whiskey sisters podcast <laughs> some things don't change we're always out for the shameless plug we're always like trying to hook people in desperate for subscribers and all that jazz aren't we Anka? yeah yeah yeah, yeah. subscribe yeah. tell your friends do wow. it do it do it may your glass be full and your dram on fire <laughs>